can't see me? Now I can. I can see that you have a Prezi. Okay. All right, so I chose to talk about um, managing off-test students, and I'm glad that Dylan went first because what he said with um, middle schoolers having the attention span of a squirrel mm -hmm. is very true. Um, a few reasons why students could be off task. There, there could also be underlying conditions such as ADHD or ADD. Um, the work might even be too hard or too easy for them. If this happens, you're going to want to find um, other work for them to do. You're going to have to probably change your lesson plans a little bit just so you can get most of your students to focus. Um, it could even be like a little bit of your fault as a teacher. If your lesson plan was presented, in a disorganized manner or you're kind of jumping around the place kids just might not be wanting to follow that and they'll just choose to not pay attention for the day um a couple some common mistakes that you could make would be asking a student why they did something when you do this um you're probably not going to like their answer because they'll just tell you that they don't like your lesson or it's dumb or it's boring or something like that um there could also be a lack of planning for transition time. Um, as a teacher, we often forget to plan for this, and while both the teacher and the student are transitioning, it gives a time for students to misbehave and act out. So we need to um, find things for them to transition smoother. Um, it's common to take student behavior too personally. They usually don't mean what they say to you, they're just acting out um, and sometimes we ignore all of it or nothing at all and this is one of the harder things to do it's difficult for a lot of us to determine which behaviors to ignore and which to give attention to we tend to take ignoring to the extremes by ignoring all of the misbehaviors or none of them at all um, neither of those strategies work though Things to avoid would be large or noisy crowds. So if you're in your classroom, it'd probably be best to close the door so you have a quieter learning space and then focusing on what's going on out in the hallways. Um, try to avoid long delays between your like transitioning periods is what that's talking about. Um, try to avoid repetitive tasks, like having them spell things or write things for a long period of time. Um, seating arrangements next to people who will cause problems. I think that's pretty big. Sometimes we allow students to pick their spots and that's usually a bad idea at this age. We should also can avoid... I, can I interject something, Ronnie? Yeah, go for it. Um, speaking of that, because I have a, you know, kind of, well, in my seed 408 class, I always... From the first day, I have like assigned seating, and then we draw cards. And I've had a couple of my future teachers this semester, when they started, that was the first thing that they did was, you can go ahead and sit wherever you want. And, you know, trying to be the, you know, the laid back person. And they found out that that's not... The way to go you know it's much better to be tighter at the beginning and then loosen up and let students sit where they want but not from the beginning because otherwise it's it's chaos so it's it's you know but until people really do you know we can talk about it and we can model it for them but until they really do it themselves and find out they don't realize it so thank you for bringing that up Yep. Um, another thing to avoid would be negative language such as no or stop. But you want to try to be as positive as you can with your students. It just gives a better environment for them to be in. And if they are causing a problem, don't bring up the problem mm -hmm. in their presence or in front of the whole class. It'd probably be better to either talk to it with the parents first or one-on-one -on -one with the student. And that would just make things better and they probably would react better to it than they would if you brought it up in front of everybody. Um, what you can do is to learn names. That is like the most important thing to do. Um, 
I have a, a terrible time learning names, so as a teacher, that's going to be something that I have to work on. It's easier to provide feedback and to call someone out across the room or give them, like, when you walk up to them and say something, it's just easier and more personal. Um, back to the wall, I hadn't really ever heard of this technique before, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, it's when you're teaching and you're moving around the classroom, keep your back to the wall. This way you're facing your students and then you can scan the environment and you can um, stop oh, sure. bad behavior before it happens. If you turn your back to those students, they'll be more likely to talk or yeah, interrupt or okay. do who knows what behind your back. I'm on, um, I'm on, proximity yeah. control. Yeah, this, stuff. just oh, keep moving around oh, the classroom. Um, you can close in on students who are misbehaving, yeah, even just like touch them on the shoulder, let them know that you're there and you're paying attention and picking up that they're not paying attention and that you're watching them. If they are misbehaving, you should have consequences and I think that it's best to have like these consequences like laid out like either talk about them or post them on the wall so they know what to expect and you have to consistently reinforce them you can't just have your most problematic student always getting in trouble sometimes even your best behaved ones will do something and slip up and you can start off with a warning but you have to be firm and follow through with what's going to happen after that um, I found this video, it's called Teach Like a Champion, and it just shows ways that teachers um, control like their students without disrupting the class. And so I'll just let you guys see it. Hopefully it'll work. We can see it, but we can't hear it. 